who won so hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the second leg of our webinar series dissecting capitalism its past present and future Today's session is jointly organized by the South Asia Working Group and the Philosophy of Economics Working Group at YSI. And this session is titled as John Stuart Mill's Imperialism, the Protestant Work Ethic and its Implications for the 21st Century Global South. There's a lot packed in this title, and it is rather interesting to see how JSN's ideas and economic thought, which were primarily to serve the interests of the imperialist, can be updated, upgraded and applied to the challenges of the workers in the global south in today's times. Without wasting much time, let me call upon Diana Sorio, coordinator of the Philosophy of Economics Working Group to introduce the speaker of the session. Over to you, Diana. Hi, so thank you so much, Anisha. Uh, so I have the honor of presenting uh, today's guest. Professor Elizabeth Anderson is an accomplished uh, academic and I advise you to check her bio that was published in, in this page's event. And however, I will make a brief presentation. So Professor Anderson is a professor of public po philosophy and also a professor of philosophy and women's and gender studies at the University of Michigan. She earned her PhD in philosophy from Harvard University having joined the philosophy department at the University of Michigan that same year. She designed University of Michigan's philosophy, politics and economics program and was its founding director for two years. She has won fellowships from the ACLS and Guggenheim foundations, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and served as president of the central division of the American Philosophical Association. Over the years, she authored several books, among them Value in Ethics and Economics in 93, The Imperative of Integration in 2010, Private Government in 2017, and of course, numerous and widely reprinted articles in journals of philosophy, law, and economics. She specializes in moral and political philosophy, social and feminist epistemology, and the philosophy of social sciences. Currently, Professor Anderson is completing a book on the history of the Protestant ethic in philosophy, economics, and public policy, which will be published by Cambridge University Press. And this is the topic that will be presented here today. We much benefit from this presentation because we will have the opportunity to discuss with the author the ideas that will be presented in the book and I hope this will be of interest to all who are attending. Thank you so much, Professor Anderson. Well, it's a tremendous pleasure to be able to uh, address you uh, from halfway around the world. Uh, my current project is on the history of the Protestant work ethic uh, and its influence on the history of economics and um, on public policy. And I argue in my book, that the work ethic, a certain version of the work ethic, which I'll describe today, uh, is really lies at the normative foundations of the justification of neoliberal capitalism today. So it's still with us <laughs> and we have to think about alternatives. <laughs> okay, but now I'm gonna be focusing on John Stuart Mill. Uh, Mill had a very contradictory life. In American philosophy departments, Anglo, in fact, Euro-American philosophy departments, Mill is thought of as the greatest 19th century European liberal philosopher, a great political economist. He was an advocate for individual liberty, for democracy. As a member of parliament, he advocated votes both for poor workers and for women. He was an advocate of equality of social relationships in marriage in the workplace and in the polity at large. And he argued that it's in relations of equality that people learn sympathy with one another and sympathy is the foundation of the motivation for utilitarianism. And he also constantly stressed the injustice of despotic social relations, whether that be patriarchal marriage or slavery or despotic forms of government. <clears throat> but 
At the same time, he was also an imperialist officer of the East India Company for his entire professional life from 1823 to 1858. Okay, so he's a big time imperialist. The East India Company, a, a private corporation serving a governmental function for the British imperial system that exercised despotic control over workers through its exploitative tribute system of taxation. It imposed a despotic rule over India. <coughs> and, it, and Mill himself wasn't just an employee. He was a leading defender of the East India Company's rule over India in contrast with the alternative that was being contemplated in 1858, namely Crown Rule, where Parliament essentially would take direct control over the colony rather than leaving it to a for-profit corporation. Well, Mill himself needed to rationalize this contradiction in his life, right? He's he's a major officer in a despotic private firm. And yet in his philosophy, right, he's advocating individual liberty and attacks on despotism. And I argue that a deep dive into Mill's philosophy shows that his need to rationalize this contradiction in his life is grounded in deeper contradictions of the Protestant work ethic, which itself, the work ethic was at the very foundation of his political economy, as it was for all the classical economists. So we have to go back then to the 17th century, the time of the Puritans in England, uh, because it was really the Puritan theologians who invented the work ethic. Prime figure Richard Baxter highlighted in Max Weber's great work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. I went back. I read Weber and I went back and read Baxter and I discovered that Baxter actually has two contradictory work ethics <laughs> and Weber only highlighted one of them. So I'm gonna give you the other one as well. But in the original Puritan work ethic, the prime duty of each person is to engage in disciplined work in a calling. A calling is a specialized occupation. This is a duty of all able-bodied human beings, men and women alike. There are specific virtues of the work ethic, primarily industry, working hard, frugality, saving up, not wasting anything, temperance, no sinful indulgences in your appetites, and chastity, of course, which is a part of temperance. Each man is expected to frugally getteth and saveth as much as he can, said Baxter. Why should you be trying to accumulate all this wealth and save it up? Well, you can't spend it because that would be indulging <laughs> in, in, in sin. So you have to accumulate it. <laughs> okay, why? But what's the point of all that? Because if you do accumulate a lot of wealth through your own hard work and frugality, you're saving, that success is a sign of your salvation. So people were anxious to accumulate in order to gain certainty for their salvation. What's important, I think, is that the work ethic itself contains contradictory meanings of work. And they led to two very different kinds of work ethic. So on the one hand, the Puritans conceived of work as an ascetic discipline. You know, you work really hard and that keeps you away from temptation and sin because your nose is to the grindstone, okay? And so that notion of work as ascetic discipline ended up rationalizing the consignment of workers to drudgery, poverty, and precarity for the maximum profit of the, of, uh, uh, the property owners. That was the kind of work ethic that Max Weber highlighted in his great work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. <clears throat> it's all tied to a conception of life as a competitive race to accumulate wealth and not just pile up wealth, to, but to make 
to acquire more wealth than your neighbor, right? It's a competition, a race. Life is a race to accumulate. And perhaps as the work ethic secularized over time to show off your wealth through competitive consumption, conspicuous consumption. That is the notion of work that I'm labeling the conservative work ethic. And it came to deeply inform capitalism, arguments for global imperialism, and ultimately ended up in the neoliberal form of capitalism that the whole world, almost the whole world lives under today. But I want, when I went back and read Baxter, I saw this completely different idea of work emerging, which Weber didn't talk about, but had a very active life in the history of economic thought. In the second view, work, the meaning of work is that it's fulfilling God's will for human beings on earth. What does God command us all to do? To promote the welfare of every individual. Okay, and work is the way we do that, right? We help other people in our job, whatever it might be. And when you go back and read these Puritans, what essentially they're saying is that ordinary daily activity is sacralized. They've made it sacred. All workers, including the most menial, and they stressed even the most menial worker is performing God's will. Hence, their activity is holy. Hence, they must be honored. And they drew from that a practical business ethics. Every worker is entitled to a living wage. Employers have to pay a living wage. They have to supply safe working conditions. They're not allowed to tyrannize over their workers. They have to treat them respectfully. <clears throat> In addition, the Puritans were confident that every person has it within themselves to internalize the work ethic. That is to decide autonomously to work hard, to choose their own profession. They don't have to have other people go them into it because they can draw that out of their own internal motivational resources. So we have here the heart of the original idea of autonomy. Workers can govern themselves. In addition, these Puritans, they weren't just attacking the idle poor who they defined as beggars. People are begging for money rather than working for it. They also condemned the idle and the exploitative rich. And their eyes were very much on the lazy landlords who monopolized the land of England. They hated the landlords because these people were lazy. They didn't lift a finger. They're just collecting rents and then spending it on gambling and dancing and fancy parties and other idle and sinful pursuits. That is the heart of what I'm calling the pro-worker work ethic. And that pro-worker work ethic had a very lively existence in the development of the history of classical economics. <clears throat> All the classical economists from Smith through Marx actually, <laughs> agreed on the following points. Number one, that the key to economic growth and social pro progress is the pr assiduous practice of the work ethic under an efficient division of labor. They all agreed on this, right? It's industry, it's working hard and saving that produces economic growth and social progress. <clears throat> and secondly, all the classical economists agreed from Smith through Marx that stages of social progress correspond to modes of production. This is not unique to Marx. Marx is just following a long tradition going back to Smith. What are the modes of production? Well, you start off, human society start off as hunter-gatherers. <clears throat> In 19th century lingo, these people are savages, <laughs> okay? Back then, it, it was simultaneously a kind of normative condemnation, but also a kind of social science category. Next, people move on to herding. <coughs> <coughs> herding.
Herding societies are sometimes called barbarian, although in practice, this term barbarian was applied to any, anyone who the supposedly civilized thought needed some colonization, <laughs> right? Needed to be ruled. Then came settled agriculture in the earliest states. Uh, there was lively disagreement among political economists at the time whether peasant-based agriculture is barbarian. Okay, that's very important. The conservative work ethic people said it was barbaric, <laughs> right? And that's why they they didn't like the Irish because the Irish were engaged in peasant-based agriculture. <clears throat> And finally, you get civilization. Civilization is a, 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 a fully flourishing commercial and industrial society with an advanced division of labor and technology and extensive markets. The key to civilization on this view is the fact that you have an efficient division of labor and people working really hard to produce a gigantic surplus. The surplus can then support the arts, sciences, education, religion, all the things that go along with what people thought at the time as the most advanced societies in terms of progress. Here now is where the conservative and the pro-worker work ethic split off into two competing schools of political economy. Malthus is the pivotal figure of the conservative work ethic. Okay, and the pivotal empirical assumption behind this, you know, I'm not even going to deal with population theory because, in fact, even though Malthus is wringing his hands over population explosion, in fact, you could dump all the population theory and you still get all of his prescriptions because they're based on the conservative work ethic. What he really cares about is what institutions are going to support and promote the practice of the work ethic. That's what he really cares about. And same with the pro-worker work ethic people. The central empirical assumption of Malthus carried through all the conservatives is that the poor have a backward bending supply curve of labor. That is, they have an income target, and as soon as they meet it, they quit working. Okay, and so if you raise wages, it means they're going to lower the amount of labor that they supply, because as soon as they meet their own family subsistence needs, they're going to quit. No, no surplus will be produced, and hence no civilization will ensue because civilization is carried by the people in an advanced division of labor who are doing things like their preachers, their educators, there are journalists, scholars, scientists, government workers, military people, right? All of these other people are really the people, uh, artists, right? These are the people who are upholding civilization. <clears throat> On the assumption that the poor have a backward bending supply curve of labor, and they'll quit as soon as they meet their own family subsistence needs, you got to force them to produce. And Malthus's solution to this problem is to insist that poor workers exist in a permanent state of precarity, <laughs> okay? That's why you need to strip the Irish of their property, right? <laughs> then they're really gonna have to work hard. <laughs> so the peasants shouldn't have property. And that's why you also have to get rid of the welfare state at the time, Britain's poor law, because that will make them lazy if they can just get handouts from the state. Instead, Malthus and the conservatives who followed in his footsteps believe that the rich have to teach the war, poor the work ethic by turning the poor into wage laborers rather than self-sufficient producers like peasant producers. And then they will assume the role of a kind of dictators teaching the work ethic, hard work to ordinary workers by imposing harsh discipline 
and low wages on them. Eventually, maybe they would be able to escape if they acquire a taste for competitive accumulation, okay? And then they'll be working hard on their own to get a surplus for their families. But until that happens, they're gonna be under this tutelary dictatorship. By contrast, the central empirical premise of the pro-worker work ethic is that labor supply increases with reward. The supply curve of labor is forward bending. This of course is a central assumption of Smith in the wealth, wealth of Nations. If you want workers to work harder, you pay them high wages, <laughs> right? <laughs> then they'll be happy to work for you. <clears throat> Smith also argued that the work ethic is strongest in workers who get to keep 100% of the fruits of their labor. Hence, we predict that the hardest workers <coughs> are the people, the workers who are working their own capital. Hence, you should support the peasant proprietor, the peasant farmer who owns their own land. They're going to work it harder than if they're just a wage laborer on somebody else's land and not able to reap any of the profits from farming. The yeoman farmer is the hero of Smith in the agricultural sector and same for John Stuart Mill. Mill himself adopts a labor theory of property straight out of Locke. And this is explicitly designed as an attack on the lazy landlords who are collecting rents without lifting a finger. <laughs> Mill condemned this as the unearned increment and he argued that you should cap rents and tax 100% of, of all the, you know, rising rents away and redistribute it. <clears throat> he was the champion of the peasant proprietor. For industry, you need lots of people working together in a manufacturing facility. <clears throat> and so he argued there, you need workers cooperatives. In both cases, he was the champion of workers autonomy, right? They can self-direct their own labor. They're gonna work hard, they already have the work ethic. You don't have to worry about that, <laughs> right? Just pay them and they'll work as hard as you want them to be and produce whatever surplus civilization needs. Okay, now, <clears throat> how, do, how does this get globalized? And here I'm thinking about the conservative work ethic gets globalized. The pivotal figure here is not so much Malthus, but a lesser known, political economist by the name of Richard Waitley. He was the Archbishop of Dublin in the Church of Ireland. Okay, very active actually in, in debating Irish welfare policy. <laughs> <clears throat> he was a Christian political economist. He wrote a very famous uh, group of lectures called Lectures on Political Economy. Second edition came out in 1832. This was, at the time, the most widely read text of political economy in the first half of the 19th century. And he devised the main theory that rationalized European imperialism around the globe. His central empirical claim is that no society or even subgroup in society is able to progress by itself from barbarism to civilization. Barbarians need help from the already civilized, okay, to move up the stage of progress, okay? That is the critical assumption. Well, you might ask then, how did the original civilization get going since there wasn't already a civilization to push them up? Waitley's a Christian. Well, God helped out the first civilization, <laughs> right? So God helped out the first, but then, but then after that, the civilizations that, you know, the societies that become civilized first have to nudge all the less, well, pro, you know, the, the, the societies at a lower stage of progress have to nudge them along and they do that by ruling them, <laughs> right? <clears throat> they have a duty to push the less civilized, civilized into progress by teaching them the work ethic, thereby bending their labor supply curve forward. 
And they do that by inculcating the ideal of competitive acquisition through work. And then all of these other societies will have people who will willingly produce the surplus that is needed to support civilized activity, the arts, the sciences, religion, and so forth. Waitley applied this theory, first of all, to Ireland, Britain's first colony. And then other political economists took off with that, applied it to the rest of the world and the whole British Empire. Okay. <clears throat> because Waitley explicitly called the Irish peasants barbarians. Okay. So this notion of barbarian has become somewhat detached from specific modes of production. And it just becomes an idea that the imperialists have about who needs to be ruled. <laughs> okay, so now here's the important thing is that Waitley ended up having a profound influence on Mill. And we can see it in On Liberty, the famous uh, essay defending liberty, where Mill defines utility as in the largest sense grounded in the permanent interests of man as a progressive being. Okay, the notion of progress here is precisely the political economist sense of progress through stages of the modes of production. And in On Liberty, Mill argued that we evaluate institutions by their tendencies to promote progress. But in his political economy, he shares with the other classical economists the view that the key to promoting progress is to get people to internalize the work ethic, okay? He also agreed with the other classical political economists that different societies are at different stages, okay, of progress. And he agrees with Waitley that different institutions are necessary at different stages of progress. At different stages, you need different institutions to promote the development of the work ethic. Mill even argues, shockingly, that at the lowest levels of civilization or lowest levels of mode of production of progress, even slavery and abject physical necessity may be justified <clears throat> for people in what he calls a semi barbarous state. To in, in order to get them to adopt the work ethic, right? So he's agreeing with Waitley and Malthus here. The press of physical necessity will get people to work hard and maybe even slavery is needed to do that. And this justifies the despotism of civilized societies over uncivilized societies on exactly the same grounds. So with Waitley, Mill explicitly argues that the spontaneous, autonomous self-development of a society is extremely rare. Now, I want to point out that he's not racist in a biological sense, since he thinks Europeans also needed despotism to nudge it, nudge, to get nudged along towards civilization. He's not racist in a biological sense, but he is racist in a cultural sense. That is, he thinks that, you know, the non-European societies <clears throat> are behind in progress, culturally speaking, and need European societies or Anglo-European societies, Anglo-American societies to push them ahead, okay? And so he explicitly thought of India and the other British colonies as not ready to rule themselves. Okay, notwithstanding the fact that India actually had a much longer and deeper civilization than England, <laughs> but he's not seeing it, right? Because he's an imperialist. All right, so <clears throat> Mill defended the rule of the East India Company. <laughs> he was an officer of the East India Company in 1857. Uh, uh, in, there was a mutiny of Indian soldiers in the East India Company's private army. And that led to a massive rebellion across India against the company's rule. 
The company engaged in an extremely violent response. It burned down villages, it destroyed whole cities, it engaged in reprisal killings and lootings. The bloodshed and destruction was absolutely enormous. It led to a scandal and parliament decided to consider whether the East India Company, which also, despite its monopoly on trade, went bankrupt several times and constantly had to be bailed out by parliament. Maybe the East India Company wasn't fit to rule India. Maybe parliament should take over. This is what they call crown rule, <laughs> right? Rule by the, by, by the crown, but in reality, rule by parliament. <clears throat> In 1858, Mill, in a desperate attempt to preserve company rule, submitted a couple of documents to Parliament <coughs> arguing for why the company should continue to rule and why Parliament was unfit to rule India. He repeated these arguments and considerations on representative government. The arguments are as follows. He says, look, Foreigners lack any sympathy with the people. They don't know how their policies affect them or how the people will feel about them. They lack local knowledge of how foreign societies operate. They don't know their customs or their social relations. Instead, foreigners have to rely on the natives for this knowledge, but they don't know which natives they can trust. The British people, they care only for their own collective self-interest, not for the interests of the colonized and will trample all over their interests. They are incompetent to judge what's best for the colonized. Okay, and right, they're just not gonna make, parliament will not make good rulers, right? Company rule will be better, he argued. Because here's an important fact about the company. Over time, it actually invented a professionalized civil service. They actually had a school where they trained civil servants. Malthus, by the way, was a political economist who taught at this school, okay? And so he's thinking that, well, professionals who are seriously trained and then sent out in the field in India can learn about India and thereby rule it. <clears throat> So it's really an argument for a, a technocratic expertise rule over India, as opposed to rule by uh, a, a, an elected parliament that's elected by the, the English people. Uh, but really the English people have, they have no idea about foreign policy or about India. So they're only going to elect representatives, so, members of parliament, so right, who will, care about England and not about India. But in fact, I think Mill produces a damning and accurate indictment of all colonialism. He proved more than he wished with this argument because a professional civil service all coming from England is still gonna suffer from all of the same defects of sympathy and knowledge, right? Uh, that, that members of parliament would. <clears throat> And indeed, this is confirmed by the realities of British company rule. What did the East India Company do between 1765 and 1858? Well, there were 12 famines in Bengal during company rule, 12, okay, due to the extraction of extreme levels of tribute from starving peasants, their disruption of a domestic grain market, the destruction of traditional methods for coping with crop failures in the name of modernization. They made a mess of everything, leading to millions of deaths. In 1785, the company destroyed an elaborate reservoir system in the Carnatic province of South India. That system was needed to enable farming in an arid re region, and they just destroyed it. <clears throat> At the same time, the fact that this elaborate reservoir system existed already demonstrated that India was perfectly civilized, already had an advanced division of labor and large scale cooperation and high level of technology that was not exhibited in Britain at the same time in the late 18th century. In 1800, India and China together completely dominated global manufacturing. They had a 53% global share of manufacturing. Under mercantilist restrictions imposed by Britain, 
This was eventually reduced to 5% share of global manufacturing by 1900. Yet Britain in the 19th century was still unable to offer anything of value to China in return for China's wares. And that's why China fought two opium wars. They didn't want to pay silver for Chinese manufacturing. They wanted to just push drugs on them, get them to buy opium, right? So we have massive amounts of misrule here. And indeed, Mill even sometimes re recognized the misrule of the East India Company in Principles of Political Economy, Volume 1. He argued that the company, through its aristocratic prejudice, confused tax collectors, local tax collectors in India, with landlords and mistakenly gave title to land to the tax collectors. When what they should have done, Mill being the champion of the peasant proprietor, he argues what they should have done is the company should have given title to, to the peasants since they're the ones working the land in classic Lockean fashion. They're the ones who've earned the right to, to the property in that land. <clears throat> and he complained that the East India Company imagined that they had created English landlords, that is improving landlords, but only created Irish ones. <laughs> that is lazy landlords. <laughs> I think the lesson to be drawn here is just the one that Mill identified, namely that imagined systems of institutions that are invented in one place and applied to unfamiliar conditions are very dangerous and harmful to people who you don't know and don't really have any sympathy with. But now I want to end on a positive note. Ideals may still have some appeal in 21st century global neoliberal capitalism. The 21st century neoliberalism is not much more than an update on 19th century global hypercapitalism of European imperialism. Both ideologies are founded on the conservative work ethic, on the consignment of poor workers to drudgery, on pain of necessity in order to feed a competitive acquisition of wealth by the better off. Mill himself thought that this is only a perverse stage of capitalism that should be and would be transcended and replaced by a pro-worker work ethic. So I think even though we should be very suspicious about these grand schemes of institutions imposed on foreign countries, the pro-worker work ethic ideal still has some appeal in the 21st century. <clears throat> Mill explained that the goal of progress is not endless economic growth and competitive consumption, but rather productivity high enough to afford everyone, everyone, a decent standard of living and sufficient leisure for everyone to be relieved of a life of tedious drudgery and to develop their capabilities, virtues, education, and to enjoy the benefits of a common culture so that they can produce and construct life in relations of sympathy with others rather than antagonistic esteem competition with others in society or in relations of domination and subjection. Given that most people are now subject to global capitalism, the question is how to overcome its perversions that Mill accurately identified and afford a better life for everyone. And I believe that the pro-worker work ethic points to an appealing ideal, but the institutions that are needed to realize this need to be responsive to local customs and conditions. And hence the development formulas of global capitalist institutions such as the IMF, the, the modern version of imperialism are not to be trusted for the same reason that Mill argued against parliamentary rule. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sham is around. Sham should be. Uh, yes, you are in charge of the question and answer session. Sham, please take it over. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I'm sure that this must have raised multiple questions on several fronts. And now we will be opening the floor to question and answers. So if anyone wishes to ask Professor Elizabeth Anderson a question, please raise your hand or please type down the question in the chat. 
So the first question will be asked by Anisha, who's raised on one. Okay, so let me like warm up the entire group. Um, so Professor, here's the question. You said that Mill wanted the, the person who is tilling the land, who is owning the land, producing the surplus, to be given the necessary title uh, rather than the person who is the tax collector or the deputy who is on, on you know, of the East India Company. Do you think it's going to make any difference just by giving the title but not giving the freedom? You see, the peasants were forced to produce cash crops rather than the crops that would provide them with subsistence in India. They were forced to produce all those crops which they had to sell forcibly to the East India Company, right? So even if you celebrated the peasants saying that, oh, you are the owner of the land, at the same time, you don't have the freedom on your land, on what you want to produce, would that make any difference, you know? Or oh, you're totally right. Look, there's no defense of male imperialism, right? That's possible. It, it, and it is true that essentially what happens with the East India Company is they're using the tax system to coerce peasants to produce cash crops rather than crops that would feed themselves. Ironically, of course, you know, when Mill looked at Ireland, <clears throat> he wanted the Irish peasants to own their own land, knowing perfectly well that they would grow potatoes for the consumption of their own family. <laughs> right. But you know, he was appalled at the imperial policy on, on, on Ireland that caused like a massive famine. I mean, the fam you know, the, the proximate cause, of course, was a, a, a potato blight, but it was all exacerbated by British imperial policy on Ireland. And he saw that very clearly. But remember, he never visited India. <laughs> he had no idea. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and, you know, he had insight that it, you know foreigners don't really have full sympathy, you know, with foreign peoples, and, and so right. And, and, but he can't see that it applies equally well to himself. He should have seen that. It's a, just a gross error. <laughs> he had all the information he needed. He just didn't process it because I I just think, you know, he's an officer of the East India Company. He has to defend it. He's sort of thinking, you know, <laughs> in those terms. Hey, professor, uh, Luis, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, amazing uh, lecture, by the way. Um, I was just wondering that when it comes to uh, having uh, political institutions be like democracies, uh, it seems, do you think that maybe if you have a political institution uh, be a democracy, but also have uh, capitalism be the economic do you think really that social political institution can really be like a democracy if uh, capitalism is the way the economy runs within a country or within the world because it seems kind of they seem they both seem sort of counterintuitive uh, to how a society runs <coughs> I think it's a really great question now one way to think about it is <laughs> is social democracy possible <laughs> Okay, because the, the, the central idea of social democracy is, you know, we can have an extensive system of private property and private enterprise and extensive markets, but still have democracy, high standard of living for everybody, a robust welfare state, all these kind of nice things. And I actually think that social democracy is possible, but I believe it probably its stability depends on constraints on individual accumulation. Okay, and I, I think the evidence is piling up. <laughs> okay, like, I don't think it's an accident we're seeing democratic backsliding in the democracies around the world, and that is tied to increasing inequality. And, and the United States is just a classic case of this. You know, you know, we've we've restrained the welfare state development of the welfare state in the United States basically for the sake of a couple hundred billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> right. What are these billionaires doing? I mean, they're, they're they are financing the destruction of democracy. Yeah. You got Facebook, you got Ru you know, Rupert Murdoch and his right wing press, mm -hmm. and, and this kind of stuff. So I, I'm more and more convinced by Ingrid Robbins' argument that there have to be caps 
on accumulation. You get too much inequality and democracy can't survive. And that of course is exactly what Rawls argued in defense of the difference principle. If you, you have to keep inequality within limits or else you, uh, if you let it get too wide, you just get plutocracy and the rich call all the shots. And, and that's basically what's, you know, what's happening. Uh, just like a, one more point. Uh, it, it, when you were talking about how they wanted workers to be in a state of poverty, it reminded me how in America, uh, one of the reasons why healthcare isn't universal or cheap is because they want the working class in America to be in a state of, well, I have to work because I have to like- Oh, absolutely. Survive. No, it's a completely Malthusian yeah. assumption. It's also totally wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, you actually need decent health care to have the energy to work. <laughs> right. And, and the physical capacity to work. But this this mistake was made during the Irish famine as well. It, it's that, you know, travelers from England would go. These political economists would go and they'd see the Irish with untilled fields. Well, yeah, because they're starving to death. They're like yeah. skeletons. They say, oh, the lazy Irish. Well, you know, like. If you don't have calories in, you can't expend calories tilling the fields. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, next up, we have Neha. So Neha, would you like to say your question? Um, hi, thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm not um, un, um, uh, having my video on. Apologies for that. Um, so thank you very much, Elizabeth, for uh, the fantastic presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you a little a, a question, and this is more, you know, might might be a reflection of my own um, uh, ignorance on this topic. But I just thought I just found your pro work ethics within the um, within the Protestant ethics really interesting. And I was just wondering whether it contradicted a little bit with the um, classical economist ideas of um, dichotomy between productive and unproductive labor. And I was wondering whether you know this, this dichotomy between a productive and unproductive labor, um, I mean, how that was reconciled with the pro-worker ethics that you were talking about. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> That, that dichotomy between productive and unproductive labor is a kind of a weird thing. It doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Let me put it this way. So on one reading of the dichotomy, it's really just an attack on the Lord's consumption. What are the Lord's consuming? They're, cons they're, they're basically, they're consuming uh, all of these servants who are dressed up in livery, just basically, conspicuously showing off the Lord's wealth and slaking their vanity by catering to them head to toe. Okay, and then you can see, well, that's not really productive, right? Because it's not like leading to the progress, economic progress of the whole society. It's just slaking the vanity of a handful of landlords. You know, 30,000 landlords in England owned virtually all the productive land in England, just 30,000 in a country of 11 million at the time. Okay, <clears throat> so that's one construal. But the other construal, which you can see in Smith, is that productive labor results in a durable, like manufacturing, something that will last. Whereas, you know, the lazy, you know, the servants of the lords, they perform a service and then it disappears. It doesn't accumulate, it doesn't add up. But that distinction is also wrong because <coughs> it favors manufacturing over the, over the production of other durables. And if you, if you look at growth theory, we know that growth theory, that economic growth is based on technological progress, which is a form of knowledge. Education produces a durable, namely human capital, <laughs> right? And, and, but that education is a service. It doesn't produce a physical object that's independent of the worker, but it does produce enduring knowledge, science, technology, all kinds of knowledge work produces durable knowledge, which is the key to economic growth, 
Okay, and skills and so forth, right? And so I think this whole distinction between productive and unproductive labor makes no economic sense if you define productive labor in terms of the production of a durable, a physical object. It just doesn't make any sense from an economic point of view. Thank you, Professor. Uh, David, please. Uh, thank you for this paper. I, I really enjoyed it. It's a, it's a great project. Uh, speaking as a historian, this really chimes with what 19th century historians have seen around our liberalism and, uh, and imperialism. And I have two kind of broad, well, one's a broad question, one more specific question. My, my broad question uh, has to do with, I, I'm perhaps a little more less convinced uh, than you may, you appear to be about uh, the kind of, you know, the shape of sort of the American electorate, right? That's being shaped by a few billionaires. That's really the problem, right? I mean, people are constantly voting against their own self-interest uh, in the United States uh, as they often see things through a particular Christian economic lens. And so what I find really intriguing about your project and especially about Mill is that he sits uh, at an intersection of two streams of Christian economic thinking. One is this, which you've identified as this kind of conservative view. Um, and then the other one is this more, I guess, would be more of a socialist view, right? That goes through cooperatives, uh, social gospeling movement, Christian socialists uh, in England. Of course, Mill is involved in, in promoting cooperatives. Um, and of course, once these ideas hit the kind of cultural prejudices, it, they get transformed. So I guess my, my first question is, because you raised it with, uh, with Whaley, was the question about providence uh, and the role of providential ideas uh, in these two Christian economic thinking, thought, you know, ways of thinking. Uh, and in the first, you, you sort of pointed out, this isn't kind of an old stream that, you know, God sort of implants commerce in, in the world. And, you know, and this is all unfolding as part of God's plan, right? And I'm wondering where do you see that more in Mill? And I think that the kind of the socialist stream is much less effective at bringing those providential ideas in. Uh, and even today, and this is why I raised the issue of the kind of modern American electorate, right? There is this real providential sense, right? Uh, among the Christian American electorate, right? And so I'm curious, well, what are the influence of ideas of providence, kind of the big <laughs> picture uh, in Mill and, and elsewhere? My second question is much more specific. Looking at EIC records, did Mill try and advocate for changes in specific EIC policies um, within the company as a company officer? Do we know that? Ah, so, well, the first thing about Providence, I mean, the key thing to know about Mill is he's a total atheist. <laughs> and he's like an out atheist. He's not in the closet the way like Hume was, <laughs> or even probably Smith. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, no, Providence is just not. Mill's thing. He does believe in progress, though, but he thinks it's all human generated. He's a completely secular naturalist, you know, account. Mm -hmm. okay. As far as Mill's own activities within the East India Company, you know, I think the, the key thing that would mark him, at, at, you know, as trying to promote something sort of progressive within the East India Company is that he was a champion of the peasant proprietor. And he wanted that in India, just like in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> in England, it was hopeless because there were no peasants. They didn't wipe out, right? Uh, but he wanted to rescue that possibility, but both for India and, and for Ireland. As far as the other details, uh, you know, I haven't read through all of his imperial correspondence, so I can't exactly say. Uh, but he, you know, he, he he actually had immense production, right? I mean, basically. The correspond, he, you know, it's rule by letter, <laughs> right? Is that the, the key decisions would be made in London? <laughs> and, and, but in reality, when you have rule by such large distances, in reality, it doesn't really work because mm -hmm. decisions have to be made on the ground in real time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so in practice, you have a lot of autonomy of the actual, you know, officers planted in India. And, you know, you can't, you know, if, if the army just starts running a rampage, it's pretty hard for London to, <laughs> to rein it in. It's kind, it kind of, you know, runs by its own logic in a way, <clears throat> just by the unfolding events on the ground. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because I, I guess I'm focused on the idea of the contradiction in this thought. I mean, was it a contradiction or did it completely not see a contradiction because he saw this sort of secular improvement, right, of, of imperialism in his view? You know, uh, I just think he was just completely deluded. And mm -hmm. and what's what I find so interesting about Mill on this point is that, first of all, he was by far the most well-read uh, person, perhaps in the world at the time. He had just had encyclopedic knowledge. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is that there were other observers in England who were pointing out the gross abuses of company rule. Edmund Burke, Adam Smith, there was no mystery here. People knew about misrule. Parliament itself in 1857. <laughs> Right, they're up in arms. <laughs> it was a great scandal, but you know, the way the company handled the mutiny, it was a huge scandal. And, and I just think Mill was just blind to this because of his position in the company. His role was to defend company rule. <laughs> and <laughs> I think there's a kind of cognitive dissonance there that he resolved by just sort of closing his eyes to the reality. Well, I, I guess I'm just always interested in how people resolve these contradictions and justify them themselves, right? Um, and we see this over and over again today. So that was just really why it's just not necessarily self-interest because they have to be defend the company, right? I mean, I think they're, I'm interested if there's there's more to it in the way he deludes himself. But yeah, I mean, I think if you would devote your professional career to something, you have a stake in mm -hmm. in justifying it, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want your whole professional career to have come not merely to not, but to evil. That's really hard to do, <laughs> right? So you're gonna find a rationale, but it was already readily available with Waitley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Diana and Diana. Wrap up. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, is it possible to find in your forthcoming book uh, implied a critique to Weber. Because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think that, look, Weber, The Prize and Ethic of Spirit nice. of Capitalism is a great, great work, but I think it only got, he was only half right. What is missing is this pro worker work ethic, which you can trace through the history of classical political economy through Locke, Smith, Ricardian socialists, John Stuart Mill. Even Marx, <laughs> I mean, what, what's so interesting about Marx as a figure is the centrality of work. You know, he says work is, is, is a human being's prime need. We need to work. That's where we get meaning in life, <laughs> right? But he wants work to be fulfilling to the individual worker. And, and that was a concern going all the way back to Smith that the industrial revolution was producing a micro division of labor where people are consigned to, you know, some minute task, like putting the head of a pin on a pin and repeating that operation millions of times. It's drudgery, it's mind numbing, it's soul destroying work, right? And Marx's critique of alienated labor is, pretty much the same as Smith's, only dressed up in Hegelian lingo. <laughs> They're all on the same page here, but you can find that even in the original Puritan theologians. When you, there's a, another theologian, Robert Sanderson, who wrote a famous lecture widely, it was in the 17th century, but it was widely republished deep into the 19th century. How do you know your calling? How, how do you know? what your calling is. And he says, look, God isn't gonna reveal to this, this to you in your dreams. The uh, occupation you are called to is determined by number one, look at the work you enjoy, right? If you like that work, it's gonna be fulfilling to you. Number two, what are your talents? Do you have skills for that work? <laughs> number three, your education. Do you have access to the ability to train up for that kind of work? <clears throat> on top of, you know, develop your natural talents. 
Okay, essentially what Sanderson was doing in this lecture was inventing what we now call modern career counseling, <laughs> right? And the ideal of work is not just that you work in order to promote the welfare of other people by manufacturing useful things or providing useful services. But it's also important that the work is something that you personally enjoy, that develops and exercises your talents. It's work that also enhances the welfare of the worker. It's right there in the 17th century. And it's, and it's a continuing theme from Smith all the way through Marx. Work has to fulfill the individual worker and not just promote the utility of other people. It's got to do both, right? And, and, and you know, that's, I think, a worthwhile ideal of work, <laughs> right? And that's at the core of the pro-worker work ethic. By contrast, what Malthus and Waitley and all these conservatives said is, let work be this horrible, tedious drudgery for the masses of people so that they produce a surplus that enables civilization to be carried on by these elite workers, right? The artists, yeah, the scientists. The sacrificial, sacrificial logic, someone has to do it, so. Exactly, exactly. But that was the, the pro-worker work ethic said, no, you had to figure out a way to make work fulfilling for each and every individual worker. And not just in terms of its external benefits, like a decent wage, but in terms of the actual content of work itself should not be mind destroying, should not be body destroying, right? It has to be something that engages our talents, our interests, our skills. After, have, after having conducted your, your research for this particular book, do you think it is possible to establish a correspondence between a given religion in a work ethic, or it's not because someone stated something and then, I don't know, either a Catholic or a Protestant picked whatever he would like and made it into something convenient. So therefore it's not possible to, for example, which uh, religion, perhaps this is a polemic question, but which religion would better serve an imperialist uh, logic, for example, what, can you notice this kind of big patterns or it's not possible to <coughs> about it like that? So that, yeah, so that that's raises the empirical question about Weber's Protestant ethic, whether in fact it was the Protestant, it was the fact that these are Protestants and not Catholics, or indeed, if you read Weber closely, it's, it's really the Calvinists as opposed to the Lutherans, <laughs> right? Who carry the work ethic. <laughs> and there I think, no, I just think empirically that doesn't really wash. No. Capitalism flourishes under many different circumstances, under many different religions. I mean, as we can easily see, uh, look, Japan, the Japanese have a stronger work ethic than perhaps anybody. Although the Chinese are certainly also, like in terms of like, industry in terms of like incredible uh, uh, determination, you know, to work a lot. There are lots of ways to motivate that. I think nationalism is one very powerful way which China is using uh, uh, to a great extent, uh, as well as, you know, as, as you know, the, the prospect of getting rich. <laughs> Right, and, and that yeah. that uh, that culture of competitive consumption, you know. So you can be detached. The work ethic then can be, and as Faber argued, was in fact detached from any specific religion and turned into a secular ideology, because it really just turned into this ideology of competitive consumption, well, competitive accumulation. You might choose to consume it, or you might just choose to just pile up the wealth in a race. And, and, and you could see that with people like, you know, the billionaires, Jeff Bezos competing with Elon Musk, right? And they can't possibly consume the billions that they are accumulating. It's hard to even spend them as fast as they're making them. They're just in a race with each other who can pile up the most points. I mean, it, <laughs> right, where points are dollars. Yeah, but I'm, I'm asking because, it, I don't know, my question stems from a very, uh, 
personal experience. Uh, so I live in Portugal and in Portugal, the majority of the country are Catholics. And I was raised Protestant. And I noticed that there since ever, <laughs> that there is a very big difference when it comes to work ethics. And, uh, and there really is a very big difference. And it took me a long time to understand why was something that to me was normal so such a contrast and a shock uh, to people around me. And I started noticing a small thing and then I was able to put it together. <laughs> huh. And I was able to identify that there is a very different work ethic uh, in Protestants and Catholics, very, very different. And of course, in my opinion, mine is better, but <laughs> that, that can be discussed. But uh, but yeah, but th there is a contrast. There is a very big- Ah, you see, now that's completely fascinating. And this, you know, it might be that we have to be more fine grained then. So in America, I just think, the influence of the Protestant work ethic just spread out very widely across the whole country, regardless of denomination or, or, or religion. The work ethic is just huge in America. Uh, maybe it's somewhat less, maybe it's somewhat attenuated in uh, the American South, <clears throat> but I don't actually think it's a religious thing. It's more because of the legacy, the enduring legacies of slavery. Right, hard work was what the slaves did, right? Yeah. And, and so uh, uh, you do see, I think, a, a relatively diminished uh, uh, work ethic among white Southerners, actually. <laughs> um, uh, be, be, and I just think it's a legacy of you know racialized slavery. Um, but but I but I, I'm totally open to the possibility that in, in different parts of Europe you can see that sharp distinction. It's just that in America, it's just so deep. <laughs> yeah. In America, yeah. yeah. Because when you mentioned, for example, Baxter's perspective, that that's what is familiar to me. And that's why ah. I, that's what I identify as Protestant. And yes. of course, I know that it can co totally go overboard. Yes. Especially in America and used for very strange purposes. So the perhaps Weber perspective. And so, but yeah, here... Yeah. <laughs> the Baxter perspective is what I identify as the Protestant work ethics. And so that's so fascinating. Experience. All right, so are you a member of a Calvinist denomination? Uh, no, no. Ah, so what is your denomination? Uh, it was a Protestant, the Adventists. Oh, interesting, okay. So that's that's like completely fascinating. No, I, I'm also, totally open to that possibility that there are differences in work ethic depending on theology. But in America, it's really just overwhelmingly about competitive accumulation. <laughs> it's yeah. you know, it's it's secularized and spread out across society. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Guillaume, would you like to ask the question? Well, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. It's okay. Siam, thank you very much. And thank you, Elizabeth, for this uh, uh, lecture. Um, I wanted, I would love to hear your opinion about the question concerning how should we read those texts, texts um, today? Uh, how should we think about Mill's ideas? Or um, should we just say, well, Let's just isolate those beautiful ideas and 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 keep them and just think that he was you know a, a man of his time and he had his own uh, limits or uh, biases um, or should we think about some more essential connection between his uh, part uh, in the uh, uh, British imperialism and, and his writing or thinking. Oh, yeah. Well, <coughs> it, you know, in my in my historical work, I think that the the study of history gives us two kind of resources for normative thinking today. One is uh, when you study the origins of 
certain ideas that continue with us. You can, uh, you often find that they, they were designed for circumstances that no longer exist. <coughs> and so to a certain degree, we become prisoners of obsolete ideas, <laughs> right? And that's something that can be uncovered. And, and sometimes also when you do the genealogy of these ideas, you're, you see that they're just rooted in assumptions that are false, but the assumptions have been forgotten. You know what I mean? And so uncovering the original rationale is very useful for critique because it exposes like the full argument, most of which has been forgotten. But then when you expose that, you realize, hey, like this makes no sense for us today. So one, way, one normative use of history then is to give us the insight to uh, escape the cages of our own ideas, okay? Uh, but, but the other use of history is, uh, what you realize is that often you dig up the past and people saw things differently. <laughs> that we're not, you know, there are, that there are open possibilities for human beings because look at how people conceptualize life in the past and maybe then the past can offer resources for us and and that's the that is the project of my you know my book is excavating the forgotten pro-worker work ethic right as a resource that we can use today to kind of enrich our current thinking about what work is and what it should be for us Okay, and, and that's one of the things that I love about classical political economy and the history of economic thought. I really urge every economist to go back and read the classical political economists. Granted, their ability to model economic phenomena was very limited. Okay, so you're not gonna go back there and look for models, fine, but, what the classical political economists had was a much richer welfare economics. It's incredible the, the, the kinds of evaluations that they're making <clears throat> are very, very useful in, in evaluating economic arrangements. They're looking at what work does to workers, okay? And they're conceiving of society as something that reproduces itself over time, reproduces workers over time. And what becomes of those workers? Are they just reduced to, you know, drudges who are dragging their feet to work and being destroyed in mind and body by the work? by their tedious drudgery. Well, that's an awful thing. <laughs> it doesn't really, yes, maybe they have more money in their pockets, but this is an awful experience. They're spending a third of their weight, you know, of their, of their lives, you know, in tedious drudgery. That in itself is objectionable, said Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, <laughs> Karl Marx. They're all on the same page here, uh, right? Another thing that they looked at was, how do economic arrangements affect the quality of human relationships that we have with each other? Okay, and in particular, <clears throat> how much of our lives are caught up in competitive, conspicuous consumption or competitive accumulation? Is that really worth like enduring mountains of drudgery just to slake our vanity in some zero sum positional competition? Really, isn't there, isn't life, you know, can't we do something better with our lives? <laughs> <laughs> right, and just think about how that puts us in an antagonistic relation to other people. This is extremely important because modern social psychology shows that <clears throat> the people who we compete with are the people near us in the distribution of whatever it might be, esteem or wealth or income. <clears throat> But that means that we tend to be especially hostile to the people just beneath us. 
the people nipping at our heels, <laughs> right? And we get especially fearful if we feel that the people just beneath us are catching up, okay? And, you know, if, if, when I look at the toxic politics in America today, it's fundamentally based on that positional fear of groups that once enjoyed unquestioned superiority of esteem and advantage, <clears throat> now feeling threatened by people racialized as not white, <laughs> right? And catching up both in terms of demographic numbers, but also in terms of esteem, uh, cultural esteem, in terms of access to certain advantages like higher education. But I think even more on the cultural realm, if you look, you know, turn on American TV, it's vastly more diverse in terms of who, what actors are, you know, on TV <laughs> than in the past. And even though it's still not even remotely close to demographically representative, you know, typical white person turns on the TV, <laughs> right? And they're no longer seeing a sea of white faces. <laughs> you know, I, they're seeing a much more diverse scene out there. <clears throat> and not just by race and ethnicity, but by, you know, gender identity, for instance. <laughs> that's perceived as very threatening to people, right? But that's because this whole way of thinking in terms of, well, how am I positioned above other people is essentially antagonistic, right? And the classical pro-worker work ethic people were totally on this, right? The idea that <clears throat> you should stake your sense of happiness on being ahead of your neighbor in material terms is a perversion because it, it, it then gives you a sense of your own worth that's staked on keeping other people down. Right, and, 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 and the classical economists thought this is perverse, at least the pro-worker, <laughs> you know, e economists. And, and so they're, they're looking at a, a much richer frame, normative framework for evaluating economic arrangements. And I think it's, that's still something that, that economists should be doing today. Okay. Um, Satwik, would you like to go ahead with your question? Yes. Um, you have partly already, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you have partly already answered it. I, when I often try to read Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, uh, these uh, texts, uh, their work, I often found lines which I have read quoted by some other authors. And when they quoted them, they completely talked about something different. <laughs> I mean, have you have you found this kind of thing in their writing yet? Because oh, absolutely. They're constantly misread. I think Smith is yeah. by far the most misread <laughs> of all the classicals. <clears throat> and, and partly because, and I, I actually explain why in my book. Um, it's because uh, Burke misappropriated Smith but was treated as an authoritative interpreter of Smith. <coughs> and Burke was a hardcore, laissez-faire, screw the workers kind of guy, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, he's speaking for the landlord class, essentially. Um, <coughs> Smith was, in fact, he, he thought the landlords were like this worthless class of people. <laughs> <laughs> they're just a bunch of lazy people just sort of sucking up the rents, right? He had no, and he hated, well, the manufacturers were also scheming monopolists. They're horrible too. The, his, you know, his champions are always the workers, the great mass of people who are poor. Those are the people he wants to uplift. It's very consistent theme throughout the wealth of nations, but you, but you have to link that up to the theory of moral sentiments, which is one of the greatest works 
of moral psychology ever written. It's actually packed dense with empirical hypotheses that ought to be tested today. And indeed, there's a guy, a, a psychologist, Ethan Cross at University of Michigan, who has confirmed some of, uh, of Smith's uh, hypotheses in, in, in moral psychology, but there's much more that could be tested. Um, <clears throat> people think that they misunderstand Smith as the advocate of ruthless self-interest. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> he did think that, that vanity had ironically positive influences. So he did think that the vanity of the Lords ended up, it, it, which in itself is, is disgusting and contemptible, childish, he called it. The vanity of the Lords he said, had an ironic uh, uh, consequence due to the rise of commercial society. So he argued that in feudal times, the lords had nothing to spend their rents on, but what he calls hospitality, by which he meant like throwing gigantic feasts and feeding all these other people, but also having a retinue of retainers who he would keep, you know, he would provide their subsistence. Right, because he had he had nothing else to spend his money on. But with the rise of commercial society, then they could spend their money on like you know a fancy gown for their wife, or you know a diamond buckle, some childish vanity he called it. And when they did that, <clears throat> they had to they could no longer afford all of these hangers on and servants and so forth, uh, and. and uh, uh, in order to raise the rents to, to accumulate all this fancy conspicuous consumption, uh, they had to raise the rents, but, uh, but uh, the tenant farmers would say, if you're going to raise the rents, you have to give us longer leases. A and so they became much more independent uh, because they were on long leases. <clears throat> so the servants, instead of having to, you know, beg, uh, uh, before the lords now were released to the cities, they became manufacturers and had a level of independence because now they serve many customers and who he who serves many masters serves none, <laughs> right? Uh, <clears throat> and and the, the yeomen were also liberated. <clears throat> so vanity had an ironic effect of liberating the workers, but that was completely ironic. It, it wasn't, he wasn't saying ruthless self-interest in the sense of, you know, doing whatever will swell your head. <laughs> it's like a good thing. It's just like a, an unintended side effect. Um, and he didn't recommend it as a way of life. He thought that the quest for unlimited wealth accumulation was an act of folly because <laughs> it's not where happiness resides. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Actually, like you mentioned theory of uh, moral sentiment. Uh, one of the sections where he's talking about police and the role of police. I have seen many quotes that are saying that, you see, Adam Smith is saying the job of the police is to protect the property of the rich. And the paragraph is starting, uh, starting uh, the, Adam Smith is talking about, you see, this is happening, but this is not good at yeah, all. Right, right. Yeah. But the same sent paragraph, a part of the sentence would be quoted saying, you see, we are doing it because Adam Smith told us so. He's the father of economics, so we are right. So it's a kind of thank Yeah, you. there's very a great deal of selective quotation. But yeah. but <clears throat> one of my favorite, <laughs> this is a selective quotation on the other direction. I, I don't have it exact, I don't have the exact words, but it goes like this. Whenever a regulation is in favor of the workers, it's always just and equitable. <laughs> so don't tell me that he doesn't believe in regulation of markets. Yeah. Yeah. He was okay with it as long as it helped like yeah. the great mass of people rather than just a handful of elites. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, David, please ask your question. Yeah, sorry, it's just a very quick question. I was intrigued with something that you said about the importance of history. And do you think it shows, the impact of your work shows how 
uh, history shows really the economic connections with other normative frames and really highlights them. And that's important in a period today when economics likes to present itself as, as, as highly secularized and scientific, and it makes its claims and judgments based on that, right? Uh, and my, you know, my people in the past were much more explicit about those connections with other normative frames. And even if they weren't, it's often easier to see. So my question actually about Mill and Providence, I mean, it would have been quite a discovery if Mill had extensively discovered Providence. But what intrigued me about your talk was how he seemed to apply ideas from Christian economic thought into translate them over into a secular context. Uh, and so even today, I think one of the, the insights that neoliberals had, Milton Friedman was the great exemplar of this, is the 19th century you know, laissez-faire was, was too emotionally dry. Uh, and that you had to associate kind of classical economics with a kind of a normative framework, right? You had to give it an emotional charge when you translated it over to a larger audience. Uh, and in some sense, uh, the kind of pro-Christian economists were much less successful at doing this, or sorry, pro-social, you know, social welfare economists were much less successful at doing this. Uh, if you look at kind of, you know, work in the, in the 1950s and 1960s. So does your work uh, open up how we think about economics uh, and its relationships to other normative frames? Ah, uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> I certainly hope to do so. Um, yeah, and, 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 and also encourage economists to range more widely across norm, you know, normative ideas. It's, it's not all just about efficiency, right, or economic growth. Like there are these other concerns here that I think are even more fundamental about the quality of human relationships, about, about like how, what, you know, the main product of any economic arrangement is people themselves. What do we become like? <laughs> right? <clears throat> are, you know, are we ground down, uh, you know, into drudges, right? That's important. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, and I agree with you entirely that, that uh, even as the work ethic got secularized over time, a lot of the residues of sort of Puritan values continued. And in fact, I have a chapter on Bentham because Bentham also was another out atheist of his day. Uh, I, I mean, like actively encouraging scandal, <laughs> uh, scandalous atheist beliefs. Um, <clears throat> so he was a, a famous uh, advocate of uh, dissection uh, uh, it, for the anatomy schools, dissection of dead bodies. Um, and uh, he advocated that the poor who died in workhouses that were uh, uh, unclaimed, these are sort of these horrible, like places of slavery <laughs> for the destitute um, that had very high death rates. He argued that they should be dissected <coughs> because there weren't enough criminals who were executed at the gallows to dissect. <laughs> It caused great outrage and scandal across England that he said this, but he says, well, it's just a body, right? It's just matter. But even Bentham is deeply, deeply Puritan in his attitudes, in his orientation. And I show that in, in, in detail in my chapter uh, uh, on the conservative work ethic. So one thing about these, so the, here's two really interesting features of the, of the Puritans. Number one, they're hard-headed empiricists. <laughs> now, you might think, how could that be because of the Salem witch trials and all this nuttery about witches? That ended up being a great embarrassment to the Puritans in, in, in Massachusetts. And, and uh, Cotton Mather turned himself around by advocating inoculation against smallpox vaccines in Boston, which worked, by the way. <laughs> Hard science. Parents are recommended that, uh, <clears throat> you know, what do you do on Sunday after church services? Well, you know, because it's a day of rest, you're not working, but you shouldn't be tempted into idleness. So what should you do? Well, they recommended doing science experiments. <laughs> right. And, and indeed, their hard headedness uh, and their empiricism is reflected in the work ethic itself. A lot of it was an attack on. Uh, you know, the monks, they hated the monks. What are they doing? They're just praying all the time. But what about the consequences? Like, we want to see consequences in the world. That's what useful work is. 
not like holy works as the Catholic Church thought of it, which is like praying and lighting candles and singing chants. Like that has no practical effects. Give us practical consequences. So in fact, the Puritans invented utilitarianism and I, I show that it's right there in Richard Baxter. So Bentham, even though he's ultra secular, in fact, is coming out of this hard headed empiricist utilitarian tradition that is really just Calvinism. And, and it even goes along with the fact that the Puritans and Bentham shared an utter contempt for any kind of sentiment. They hated it. They're very hard headed. Give us the facts, give us reasons. None of this feeling stuff, <laughs> right? Part of it was they're skeptical of religious enthusiasm, right? But it spread out to skepticism against any kind of se sentimentality. And you find that exactly in Bentham too. <clears throat> he's a Puritan at heart, even though he's a total atheist. Thank you. Okay. And what might be the last question of the session, we will now hand it over to Diana, the co-organizer. Uh, so I was thinking in the context, uh, especially of YSI, I was thinking again of how economics is taught in universities, which of course, since the crisis 10 years ago was widely debated. But again, a piece of personal information. Uh, when I was fresh out of high school, I had to choose which uh, degree I was going to take. And I chose economics. And I was there for one year. And after one year, I said, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> I don't like it. There's something wrong with this. And I left and I entered the philosophy course. And I stayed there for many, many years. And then I went back to economics and public policy, now armed with knowledge <laughs> and history and uh, how to think about concepts and reframe everything. Uh, so my question is, I, I know I'm not the only one, of course, finding it suspicious because at the university, they try to convince you that this is the only way of doing economics. So there's a model and it's the only way. So history, philosophy, uh, thinking about concepts is all nonsense, does not feature in the curriculum in all the time that you are supposed to be there to take your degree. So, and it, as your book and for sure your work proves, it takes a lot of work to deconstruct all the misunderstandings that for many decades tried to convince you that this is the only possible way of doing economics. And my question is, how, why is it taking so long to deconstruct <laughs> the model that became predominant? So many people for several decades tried to articulate that there are alternative ways, but they keep doing it at, a, at the margins. And for some reason, it's very hard <laughs> to actually burst the bubble of the predominant model. Why is that yeah. so? You know, this is such a wonderful question because, <clears throat> you know, I started off as an undergrad wanting to major in economics. And, and then I moved to philosophy. <laughs> now, part, part of it was just like, did I, it, it, remember I, I, was, uh, I was studying economics in the late seventies <clears throat> and, and Economics, I don't think was in a very good state in that time because everything was just about making these a priori models. It wasn't very empirical back then. I, I think actually one of the greatest developments of economics in recent times is they're just way more empirical and they're very creative with data sets. I just love that. I mean, e economics should be really empirical. And then you get surprising results like, yes, there's, a, there's been this model for the longest time, for instance, that minimum wages will call out, cause unemployment. And then we had these wonderful economists, well, we can test this, <laughs> right? And they found out that wasn't true, <laughs> right? So that, so yes, I, I, I'm totally in favor of recent developments, but, but at the time, 
because it was all abstract a priori model building, I just didn't want to be doing that. <laughs> Right, and I was much more drawn, though, to the you know to the classical tradition and the history of economic thought, when uh, the, you know the same people who are the great economists are also great philosophers, <clears throat> where they actually see economics as not just a kind of a, a, a sort of social science in the technocratic sense we think of today, but actually as a humanistic discipline, where there are lots of things that you care about. And you want to think about, well, what institutional arrangements are going to help people <laughs> in the broadest and fullest sense of helping people in a very rich sense, right? Normatively rich sense of helping people. That's, that's what they're after. And I find that still enriching. And that's why I think economists should all be studying the history of their own discipline. <laughs> Right, because it, it just opens up imagination, a normative imagination <clears throat> to range more freely and widely and fully across all of the impacts that economic arrangements have on human beings. <laughs> in economic degrees that will perhaps accelerate more alternatives to the prevailing model, that that is what yeah. is what has been missing, that history and philosophy is included in economics that of course teach uh, basic tools and how it works right now but gives insights of what can be different and what has been thought as a different alternative yeah that is key yeah uh, yeah let's hope so <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very now I really I'm really very interested in reading your book <laughs> for many different reasons. Thank you so much. Very well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So now I have the responsibility to formally thank you and close the session. Uh, so how to do it? I don't know. Oh, thank you very much. For your uh, it's time. Been such a pleasure to talk to you all and feel free to. Uh, you know, correspond with me. Yes, we will keep doing it uh, and thank you for replying. Thank you for your time. Uh, despite we have such a small time difference, only 12 hours <laughs> to take. <laughs> so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Anderson. And uh, um, now we will end the session. We have two more sessions for this webinar series. Uh, um, Robert Walker would be talking about his uh, understanding of poverty and poverty induced shame. Uh, while looking at uh, China. He's uh, now uh, a scholar there after retirement from uh, Oxford. He's spending time uh, at Beijing Normal University. And the last session would be Sanjay Reddy talking about so-called established theories of economics uh, and application as a public policy tool and their limitations. Uh, if you have time, please join us. And thank you, Professor Anderson, once more for your time and attention. Thank you. Thanks. It was a delight addressing you all. Uh, where is the uh, we have to end the record button. I don't have the Anisha.